Okay, um, I don't need this. Um, so this is Dr. Morton. Um, this is Micro uh, One for uh, the 22nd. Okay. So the, uh, okay, so anyway, so here's the syllabus. Let's scroll down here to where we are. Okay, lost my scroller. And let me fix this too. Okay. And so here we are on the 22nd of October. Boom. Review for practicum one. So I, what I'm going to do really is I'm going to get ready for the lab. I'm still thinking about the practicum. I haven't figured it out. So I think at this point I'm going to either postpone it. So let me tell you what what my original intent with the practicum was about. And, and well, what I am going to do today, I'm going to talk about the LCD a little bit. And um, yeah. So I'm going to do that, and uh, I'm also going to talk about project, uh, and I think I'll do the project first. But but let me. Um, so I'm going to I'll blow this up a little bit. Let's see if it may go the other way. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So um, so the so the intention of the practicum is to just make sure everyone really does put their board together, and also to uh, at this point in the course get you to. Uh, the way I've normally done in the past, you come into class, the first thing you do is every single student demonstrates their Viva board blinking LED. And then I pass out sheets, and you can work in groups of one, two, or three, and you basically have a little problem to do. And it, it usually has to do with a blinking some color in some pattern. And basically, you just have to write a little bit of code to make it do that. And you can do it in assembly or C. And it's, it's not super difficult, but it does mean that you have to buckle down and get it done in the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes, pretty much by yourself or with one or two other students. And and what that does, that really makes everybody kick in and participate. And, and it really does, uh, you know, it really does demonstrate that you can write code for this board and, and, and that you put your board together, that you did complete it, you soldered it, and it's all working. So that's the intent. It's other than that. It's I'm really. It's not a big, big deal. I just, you know, I just feel like it really is helpful, and it's also kind of a substitute for writing code. But I'll, we already had the, you know, we already had the coding test. So I don't know. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is just delay this, and maybe at the final exam I'll incorporate a a little piece because I've usually made the final really easy. And uh, I think maybe what I'll do is just add a little bit of a hardware piece to your final exam. And uh, and I'll basically, as part of the final exam, I'll tell you, okay, each individual student, uh, here's what I want you to do. And, uh, and you know, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, everybody will be able to knock that out as part of the final exam. And I already have some ideas. So I think what I'm going to do is cancel the practicum and I'm going to fold a little practicum into the final exam. And the final exam otherwise won't be particularly difficult, but there will be a little practical part. So let me just warn you now. You need to be, you need to make sure, one, you your Viva board is working and you have it. Two, that you have your SNAP programmer Three, that you have MPLABX up on your laptop or desktop or some computer at your house or wherever you're going to work that you can use so you can, you can do this during the final exam. And if you don't have those things, then you better let me know because you're, you're going to need them for the practicum part of the final. And uh, so, uh, so we won't be doing the practicum. So I'm going to change the syllabus and I'll upload a new syllabus. All right. Meanwhile, let me uh, let me shrink this back down, and I'm going to shrink a little more over here, maybe even. Let's see. And then I'll kind of put there. We go. That's not too bad. And then um, we'll get rid of this. And here I am. <laughs> All right. So let me talk about the final project. Okay, so again, the, the whole idea of the final project is many students really learn, you know, they this is where you really feel like, okay, yeah, I, this is kind of exciting. I can really do something. Now, I, because 
uh, I will help you. And we can do a lot of debugging online. And the labs are open. You can come in and we'll do it in person. So, so, but it's probably good if you don't bite off something super duper hard. But I will help you if you need help, either on Zoom or in lab. And I'll make myself available at least uh, four days a week in lab and, and then a couple of times on Zoom every week for you guys, at least, and more often if need be. And we want to get we want to get started on the project. I probably will delay till the very end. So it, so I'll probably make the final project due like the last day of class, something like that, uh, or maybe maybe a few days before the last day. But I, I want you to have as much time as possible. And all you have to do to turn it in is upload a video of your final project operating and put your ID card in the video at the beginning or somewhere in there. And uh, and if you have other team members, we should see their ID cards too. So, and remember, you can have one, two, or three people on a team, but that's the max. Okay. All right, so let's go through this. Um, so, uh, I talked about the practicum. Uh, we've already talked about interrupts. We we There's a few of these things we haven't covered yet. Um, we covered A to D, D to A, touch, you are a little bit. We haven't talked a lot about SPI and I squared C, so we will do that. Um, and then the project. Okay. So for the practicum, uh, remember this whole idea is it, when you create an embedded design, there's, there are definitely piece and pieces to this. One of them is you have some overall system design to do. You have a user interface. It, you have a user interface. You have, you, then you have, uh, that's the human part. Then you have your actual uh, process uh, and how it interacts with the with the real world. That interface, and then you have to write your firmware, and then you have then you need to have a plan for how you're going to support it uh, with updates or however that's going to work. And the firmware means you have to be able to write some code, and you have to be able to understand an algorithm. Now, the, un, how to, this implementing an algorithm is probably one of the pieces that's sort of hardest to teach. Uh, but in some ways, it's kind of one of the most critical pieces. And uh, move this a little bit. No, that's the wrong way. There we go. I think I did it. Maybe. Uh, is that better? I think so. Okay, well, anyway. So, and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about that. That's where you may need help. And I, I definitely run into that. And then the other part is debugging it. Uh, you may have a pretty good idea of what you want to do, but you may make a couple of mistakes and leave out some things and then it doesn't run and you're not sure why. And, and I can help you with that, uh, having debugged a bunch of these things over the years. Uh, so we'll make it work. Um, okay, so, so implementing an algorithm. So it involves a series of steps to get it something done, right? And so there may be some uh, some calculations required, data processing. There may even be some sort of some some uh, AI type stuff. You may uh, you may have to implement some control theory. You may have to implement uh, uh, a, a, a complicated decision tree based on sensor readings. Um, and generally, the way we implement algorithms is we do them uh, in in a series of sequential steps. Uh, we may jump from one step, uh, skipping a bunch of steps to the next step, or we may always go step by step. And then you must have to, you then you have to figure out how to inc to make your steps so that you can code them up. And if you set it up so that each of your steps is self-contained, then it's a whole lot easier to create the individual steps and and debug them and uh, get them to work. If they're super all interdependent, then it can become very difficult to get things really working because bugs become very difficult to uh, sort out, trace down, and, and uh, get rid of. So, so it's really important to think in, in terms of modularity. Try and divide your tasks up so they are self-contained. So the results of one task can be passed to the next task. And once it gets those results, then it's able to function pretty much uh, independently and, and come to the outputs that then need to be passed to the next task. Um, 
All right. So, and sometimes the task may have to be revisited multiple times. That's fine. Uh, every real world problem has complicated parts of it, clearly. So the steps that you have, that the steps have to flow from sort of an overview or a high level understanding of your of what you're trying to do, and uh, and w as in regards to that, you you do have to ha clearly spell out what it is you're trying to accomplish. So if you're if you have a vague definition of what you're trying to do, you'll have a really difficult time implementing it because you won't know what your step one, step two, step three ought to be. And so that, that will make it really challenging. So you, the more clearly you can define your task and divide it into uh, self-contained module or parts, the, the easier this job is going to be. All right. And let's see, do we have, uh, hang on. Okay, so, um, so that's really key. It's also one of the one of the biggest pitfalls is when people kind of uh, you know just start writing code before they've really thought things out, and then they get you know a hundred lines of code in and they realize oh you know gosh I, I didn't really think about it. we've got this whole other piece I never considered how am I going to fit that into this and they wind up with this biggest kludge of code you'd ever want to see in your life that's very very difficult to finish very difficult to make it work well and very difficult to debug it when it doesn't so one of the things that's really important here is to think about well before I start writing code I've, I've defined what it is I want to do but now let me think if there's other very several different ways to do this and it may be when you you know think a little more broadly about how you want to do this you may come up with some really great novel approaches to uh, implementing the task this you know basically to implementing the task you want to implement and this this can really be a major time saver if you come up with a much simpler approach than the one you originally thought of um, you also need to understand some of the trade-offs involved that's really the essence of engineering right we we take uh, it's not that we just come up with solutions, but we, we come up with solutions where we've really worked through the process of trading off uh, a number of different options to try and get to something that's, you know, somewhat close to an optimal solution. So, uh, you know, how, so we need to think about how fast is the, does the code have to run? How, how, you know, how big does a code have to be? Uh, how complex is each submodule? Is it easy to follow, or is it so super clever that uh, you know when I look at it next week I won't be able to remember what I did or why I did it? Is it kind of just a slap it together, or is it uh, really robust and uh, elegant? And then have I left myself some nice hooks for future development and enhancement, or did I just you know blast through, document it poorly, and this is going to be really tough to maintain and support going forward? And then kind of talk your way through all the steps and sort of listen to what you see as, as potential problems and issues. And then get a real, as much as you can, describe what, this, what the output of your, of your system should be. And, um, and then ask yourself, okay, so what I'm proposing to do, is it going to get me there? Is it going to get me what I visualize I want the output to be? And then, uh, and then always think about some other approaches and, and what might... Uh, be helpful there. So one of the things that's really a good idea is to do a block diagram of your system and have a flow chart for your process. And if you know we used to preach this flow chart thing till we were blue in the face. Uh, I don't I don't know if all the attention we used to give to it was really justified or not. But I do think having some outline of how you want your code development to progress, what you see is the steps the code has to go through, I think that's super helpful because it can really help you think about how to break it down into, the, into individual self-contained modules. And the block diagram is super helpful when you think about 
how you're going to assign various pins and and how you're going to uh, make sure that the microprocessor you've selected is going to work where you've got some rough idea of say the 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 throughput that's required to make the thing work how, how much data has to come in how fast does it have to go through what kind of processor speeds is that going to take will this chip be able to do it or do I need to change to a, to a faster chip um, more powerful chip with maybe hardware features I don't have on this one or uh, is this chip going to be adequate save me a little money because it's a little less expensive and uh, what modules are not built in is there a chip I can find that would have them built in or do I just have to buy them separately and interface them what are the pros and cons of doing that and uh, is, is, is my anticipated program size going to fit in the, the available flash memory? Do I have enough RAM for, my, for, the, for the amount of data that I feel like I'm going to be dealing with? These are all questions that you really should be thinking about. Now for your senior design project, I mean for your uh, Micro 1 final project, maybe less so. For senior design, you, you probably would really need to be thinking about these things. And of course, in industry, you definitely want to be thinking about these things. You really want to cover all the bases. Okay, in the end, you, you, uh, how do you learn these, uh, these, how do you learn how to develop problem solving algorithms? You learn it by developing problem solving algorithms and get better and better as you do more of them. That's one of the reasons why we assign special projects, and that's also one of the reasons why I like to do the practicums, because it, it forces you to think your way to a solution, and that's that's really the, the skill that we're trying to teach. I mean, technicians can solder things, and, and people who've taken a programming course can write code, but you're an engineer. You're the professional. You need to be able to see the whole picture and put it all together. And I, I think that's really uh, an important part. Okay, um, so let me, uh, let's see, I think, um, yeah, let me, so now I want to talk just a little about uh, your final project and, and give you kind of an example, and then I'm going to talk a little more generally about all the various things you could consider doing. Okay, so here's a, here's a project I'll d talk about a little bit in detail. Let's say we're going to connect a temperature probe using an analog input. So we're going to use something like the uh, MCP9700 uh, that's on your little uh, analog plug-in board. And we're going to calculate the temperature from the voltage, and we're going to output it to, an LC to a 2 line by 16 LCD display using the I2C bus. Great. So what's involved? Well... We have to have a temperature sensor. That's on our little analog board, so check. We've got that already. We have an LCD display. Uh, check. Uh, and by the way, uh, I took in the LCD displays today, uh, or, well, Wednesday. And uh, so they're at UTSA. And then if you want to pick one up and sign it out, I'd like to get it back. But you can pick one up and sign it out uh, and, and keep it till the end of the semester and then turn it in. Uh, the they are they're they're going to be available uh and i guess we'll make them available friday from 10 till the end of lab so just let me know and we'll we'll, we'll basically uh, capture um you know what what uh you know well what parts what parts anybody needs i i kind of got distracted there all right so um yeah so let me finish uh, so so let me finish this, and then I'll talk about that a little more generically. All right, so the modules involved in this project, this temp probe using an analog input, and then we'll calculate the temperature from the voltage that this temperature sensor outputs, and then we're going to write it to an LCD display using the I2C bus. Okay, great. So it needs we need the temp sensor, and that will be on the analog board. We need the LCD display, which you, you can pick up on Friday, and I want everybody to come in and do that. And then three, you're going to use your A to D module and your I2C bus protocol. Uh, now we'll give you some code to help you drive the LCD display with the I2C bus. We'll give you we'll give you an include file that has some some functions that let you uh, send commands and data to it, so that you can control the module and you can display um, 
and you can display data. Um, we also have there's there's also pots available on the uh, on your plug-in uh, analog board. We have uh, we have uh, sorry we've got a, a th three color LED of, uh, that's on your board. Uh, you can um, you can interface something like a real time clock, um, and uh, and you can use uh, the LCD display with I2C. You can also send uh, information to your desktop or laptop using USB. Um, we have a, 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 an ultrasonic ping, ping, ping sensor that can measure distance, so you can interface that. We have servo motors, so you could use those and uh, control those with PWM. Uh, we have timer modules on the chip. We have uh, a digital to analog output on the chip. Uh, that typically has to be buffered to be usable. We have, uh, we have our built-in uh, USB interface with our UART, and we've already used that a number of times. Um, we, have, uh, we have an IR uh, reader and a little handheld uh, uh, remote control device that you can send uh, uh, control information to your microprocessor on. You can interface that. Um, for that, though, you do have to write the, uh, the code to decode the, uh, the, the little remote control device. Uh, I've had students do it. It's a little bit trick. It's challenging. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you really want to bite off a big chunk. The, then you can do uh, the RFID reader. I have some of those. And uh, they come in different flavors, but we have kind of one of the simpler ones. And we've got some tags to go with it. And you can, you can interface this, and you can just read the tags. It's very cool. You can interface a GPS receiver and display information that it's throwing off. Um, you can you can uh, interface you can uh, have a passive infrared sensor that detects uh, you know heat within a uh, a range. You've seen these uh, used for uh, lights over the uh, outside of the house where somebody walks by and it turns on the light. Um, you can interface a joystick. You can interface uh, uh, you can use uh, Bluetooth and interface that and communicate with a la with a smartphone or a desktop you can use the uh, again the uh, the analog board has a photoresistor temperature sensor and a potentiometer on it so you can use uh, all three of those um, with that analog board they're all available you can get an IR LED and uh, send data over some line and read that with the IR um, LED uh, there are some RF modules that let you communicate for, from uh, from one one say one Viva board to another Viva board if you want to set that up, um, and you can interface uh, a touch panel, a big resistive touch panel. Um, just a lot of things you can do. You can of course use the touch pads on your on your Viva board. Um, so the proposal should say, "Here's what I want to do," and uh, there. I, I, I wish I maybe I'll maybe I'll make some proposals maybe I'll pull up some from previous years and post them. Um, you should list all the all the modules, devices, and interfaces that you're going to need for your total system, and then all the group members for your project, and then uh, turn that in by the due date, which I it might have been on Tuesday, but I I, I may I'll just go ahead and extend that to to maybe even Saturday. Uh, I'll maybe change the dates. Let me do that right now. Okay, so uh, so again, your proposal should, and now I made it so it's due next Tuesday. So you've got till next Tuesday if you haven't turned it in, and I'll, I'll change the due date uh, also on Blackboard. Okay, so you will be able to uh, to turn it in. Actually, it was uh, I, I hadn't set a due date, so it's still available. So go ahead and submit your proposal. Uh, list all the devices, interfaces, and modules you're going to use. Uh, say what the system is going to do. List all the group members and what each member is going to be responsible uh, for. And then uh, and turn it in on Blackboard in the provided link. And then make sure you have a little notebook started so you keep track of, of uh, the progress you're making. And the things, the dead ends you went down and problems you had and that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're not going to worry about the poster. We'll talk about that later, or maybe not at all. Okay, 
I think I'm going to switch over to the 2 line by 16 display now. Yeah, not that one. Hmm. Oh, I see. Got to do this. All right, now. Yes. And here we go. Okay, so the LCD display. Um, yeah, okay, that's good. That's, yeah, that's what I wanted. Uh, picture. Okay, so we're going to do the overview. So first off, uh, these are really great devices, and believe it or not, they're still they're still used. Uh, I I will say you know some of the little OLED displays are starting to replace them because they're you can do you can do graphics with those a lot easier than you can do you can do a little bit of you can do some limited graphics with these, but um, with the OLEDs you can really do some, um, and you can get them in different sizes, but these are pretty cheap. And the OLEDs are still maybe a little more expensive, and a little more, a little more of a hassle to uh, write stuff for. This is a lot easier to drive, but uh, but you will see these. Uh, I I I think every printer I've ever owned had one of these in it. Uh, you've probably seen that too. That may that may be less true now. Uh, you might be starting to see the printers come out with a little bit fancier displays, but these are very functional and for a for a, an inexpensive sort of user interface that's not going to get much use. These are these can be very adequate. Uh, they come in a lot of different formats. And they they typically look just like this. Uh, and it's very interesting the way these things are put together. First off, you see these two black dots back here. If you look at one carefully, you'll see what those are. Is those are where the an actual we call it we call it blob on board. That's what that's called. And what that means is Instead of uh, putting pins and packaging an integrated circuit, the integrated circuit was literally placed on, on this board, covered with this, and then bonding wires were attached. Uh, very, very fine whiskers of bonding wires were attached to connect the silicon die to the various contacts that needed to be con connected to on the board. And then there was this epoxy uh, placed over the top of it to protect it and to keep it from being moved or disturbed. And there's two of them on this one. And usually those are the major chips. And, the, and why do they do that? They do that because if you buy chips, if you buy chips in the form of blob, uh, individual chips, if you buy the whole wafer, that's the cheapest usually way you can buy them. And then you have to buy your own diamond saw or laser, and then you, you saw the individual squares out, or you can buy them sawed, but not, but not otherwise processed. Other than you know, they make the chips and then they saw them up and they leave them. Uh, they leave them on a little um, shipping container that, that's exactly like the die. Only now they're 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 individual uh, little chips of silicon. And uh, and then what you do is you're in your factory. You drop them on your printed circuit board. And you uh, have a machine that puts the bonding wires on and then puts this blob of epoxy over the top. It's very, it's very, very cool. Um, and you can see these bonding wires uh, when you look in the window of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the ROMs I talked about. Let's see. Let me see if I can find one of those pictures. I'll show you. So here's a, here's a picture of a blob on board. It's not the best picture, but notice... Here's the here's the piece of silicon right here. It's just the raw die. And then these little bitty bonding wires are attached on the printed circuit board. Now this is this is really blown up. And these wires go to all these pads and they're they're basically soldered on. And then what they'll do is they'll come back and they'll put that epoxy over the top of this so that it protects it and it keeps all these things firmly uh, you know securely uh, in place. All right. So that's that's what those little blobs are back here. And then um, notice this this bezel, this metal bezel. This is really interesting. So 
what we have on this thing on this side is a piece of, of liquid crystal glass and the this metal bezel has has six tabs in it and you can see the tabs are pushed through the printed circuit board and on the back side the tabs are bent to hold that bezel in place and that bezel is pushed on pretty firmly and what's what's done is that the back side of the glass has electrical contacts and the printed circuit board has a whole bunch of contacts down here under each edge and what they do is they put this elastomeric uh, material um, and it allows for the for the glass to be connected to the electrically to the printed circuit board and those electrical connections are driven by these uh, by these uh, by these these chips that are connected uh, with the bonding wires underneath these epoxy blobs. Okay, so I I found a good example. So here's your metal compression bezel. There's your piece of glass, the LCD, and here see this elastomeric strip, and then there's a little um, there there's a little elastomeric frame, although. Usually it's it's actually part of the bezel. Uh, it is in this case anyway. And then down here, those are the contacts that the elastomeric uh, strips are going to make contact on. And uh, they all also have this standard interface here, which is 16 pins. Now, uh, it can come in a couple different uh, configurations. Well, we'll show you this. So notice you can have the standard two line by 16 display down here but you can also have a uh, you can also have um, I think this is four line by 16 or you can have four line by 20 or you can have two by 40 and several other options and they all are driven exactly the same way and you can use the exact same interface for all of them uh, and all you have to do is just change your software a little bit to uh, account for the fact that uh, you have different numbers of lines in there and they have different addresses. But that's really it. So almost always the 2x16 format is the cheapest because it's very common. The four lines are widely available but a little but more expensive, not that much more. These you can get for maybe four dollars. I think I was paying seven dollars for two. Uh, so 350 each roughly. Um, Sometimes you can get them cheaper, sometimes more. And that's with the I2C interface daughter board. If you just buy the displays, you can get them for under $2 each. And you don't have to have the I2C interface. You can, you can hook these pins up in parallel, but it does take a good six pins from your microprocessor to do it. So if you, if you do a parallel hookup, you don't have much left uh, in the way of extra pins. Uh, if you have other things you have to interface, you, you have to be creative. I mean, you do have... 18 GPIO pins, although th three of those are gone because of your uh, snap header. So that leaves you 15, and of the 15, six of them are are not you know not less than half are going to be used just to drive the parallel display. Whereas if you use I squared C, uh, you only need two pins, and you can drive other I squared C devices with the same two pins and get double duty out of them. You can even drive. A bunch of these displays because they give you the option if you run the, the little I2C daughter board they give you the option to to change it so that you can get um, uh, you can address several displays you can change the address now notice here the pins are arranged at the end but most of the rest of them have these pins here where we saw how it was on the two line by 16 but regardless of the format of the displays the actual pins are identical and 14 of the pins are the actual interface with the display and then two of the pins are the power supply for the uh, backlight for the LCD module so it lights up now not all of them have backlights in the old days most of them did not have backlights uh, which caused me great disconcert uh, when I tried to see the little display panel on my printer because it wasn't backlit and I couldn't really see it. I had to get a flashlight or something. But nowadays, uh, almost all of these displays come with built-in lights and you have to look hard to find one that doesn't have one. Um, 
and and the lighting is basically all done by LEDs, and uh, and so it's uh, doesn't draw too much current and it works great. In the old days, they used uh, typically would use something like a a electrofluorescent display, which uh, worked okay. But, uh, it's like one of those things you plug into the wall and it kind of glows in the bathroom. But the problem is they do degrade over time and they require high voltage to work. So they're somewhat complicated devices. They're not super simple. And um, so anyway, uh, nowadays with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the displays just being made strictly out of uh, uh, LEDs, it's, they work a lot better. Okay, so what's interesting is with these LCD displays, the first thing you have to do is you have to turn it on, strange as that may seem. Uh, even when you put the power to it, the actual uh, chip, even though it's powered, but it's in the it's in the off mode, and you have to you have to turn it on, and then uh, they recommend that you give it. Well, the first thing they do is recommend you give it this turn on command three times, and uh, we normally do that using uh, the uh, an, an eight bit interface. Um, so. The, the positions on this, and, and then you have to start giving it, once you get that, then you then you can set up some of the basic functions and you're off and running. The actual addresses of the various positions on the display are a little confusing, so it, you have to pay attention to that. Uh, we have two rows of 16 bits on our display. The first row has addresses 0 through F, but the bottom row has addresses um, 40 through 4F. So it's kind of surprising. Um, but it turns out that uh, all of the chips have the ability to have uh, 80 characters displayed. So there are 80 display positions in all of the in all of these devices. It's just that if you only have two by 16, then only 32 of your 80 displayable locations are actually being displayed. And so you can write characters, and you'll see you eventually write off the end, and you're actually writing someplace. Uh, it's really out there. If you had four lines or two lines by 40, you'd see it. But since you have a two by 16, you have to wait. If you write the first line, you go off the screen when you go to one zero hex, and you don't come back on the screen until you get up to four zero hex. So anyway, we'll maybe show that uh, in a bit. Okay, and then, um, so, uh, they only cost, you know, like I said, about $2 or less, and you can you can use them with a number of different interfaces, and most of them come with backlights these days. All right, so the classic description is this Hitachi 8D44780 chip, which is basically the one that runs most of them, or it's an equivalent, um, you know, Chinese knockoff or whatever. And uh, and here's here are the pins. So remember, there are 14 pins associated with the display, and then the last two pins, 15 and 16, are the backlight pins. Now, notice that the uh, that the first pin is ground, and the very last pin is also ground. And the next pins in are VDD and the positive power supply for the backlight, which is usually the same. Now, you can definitely buy these things in, uh, th that run on 3.3 3 volts, and you buy them that run on 5 volts. Most of them will run on 5. If you try and run a 5 volt one on 3.3 uh, uh, volts, it's, it might work, but it's very dim. It's kind of unsatisfactory. Uh, in some cases, if you run a 3.3 volt on 5 volts, you may blow it. Um, but I think some of them have regulators. And even the 3.3 volt devices can be run on 5 volts in some cases. So just be careful. Test it at 3.3 volts. If it works great at 3.3, then run it at 3.3 and don't try it at 5. Uh, but all the chips I'm going to pass out can run at 5 volts. Then we have uh, a pin that's called contrast. This is a strange little pin, but it if when you use the I when you use the I squared C interface, that contrast is is controlled by a little uh, small pot on the back. And I will show that to you right now. So let me flip this up and I'll pop this over here and make it bigger and change the camera. And 
what you can see is there's a little blue pot right there and you have a little screwdriver and if I fire it all up which I can do right here this should work we'll hook it up can't see so we'll hook it up and then we'll I think that I can't remember if that's right or wrong and oh uh, shucky shucky poo let's see uh, crud All right let me get let me get one uh, that one has the wrong address all the chips I'm going to give you have the right address. Uh, they're all addressed at 27. Oh, I took them all in. Oh, no. Oh, crud. <sighs> okay. Shucks. I can't. Uh, okay, well... All right, let me, what I'm, what I'm going to do is pause this and change the code. Okay, so here's the, here's the program. Now, what I have to do, there's a, a line of code here that says I2C slave 0x27. And uh, I have to change this to 20 because, uh, because the address of the, I took all my, I took 60 some, uh, 67 of these into the UTSA. And all the ones I took in have a slave address of 27. But the one I have here to use to show you has has to have a slave address of 20. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. You can actually change uh, four bits of the slave address. And how come how come this thing is out of line? I don't know. It's confusing. Okay. So anyway... So now that I have that, I'm going to reprogram it and we'll show it popping up here. And we'll shrink this down a little bit. There we go. Now we're going to program it. And I don't know if we're going to... Oh, yeah. Okay, now it should show. But you can't see what it's showing. Now, what I'm going to do... Oh, put this back on. And so if I turn the potentiometer back here, I can adjust it. So you, so you can see that we, we get this as we, turn the, as we turn the pot. Let me hold this up like this. As I turn this pot with the screwdriver in the back, you can see the, the front kind of changes a little bit. And so, so I'm going to adjust it to where I think it needs to be. And then hopefully I'll get it to show up. Hmm. Well, it did work, but now it's not. Let me stop it and see if I can get this fixed. Okay, so here you can see, you can see that it's writing up here uh, a letter at a time, and you can see you can see the letters. The it's if I make it too bright, uh, the letters are very visible to me, but uh, you can wash them out by shining too much light or by having too much exposure on the camera. It just it blinds it. So anyway, and uh, and it's just writing these out now. Notice. It's eventually going to go off the end. It just did. So it, the last letter was P, Q, R, S, T, U, V. It's still writing those to the display, but those letters aren't showing up. And then we'll let it run long enough, and eventually you'll see when it gets 40 more letters out, or not 40, but, uh, well, so it has to go through 1, 0 to 1, F, 2, 0 to 2, F, 3, 0 to 3, F, and 4, 0. Then you start seeing the letters come back. And, uh, and it's doing, so it's 16, 16, 16, 16. And then it comes back. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, 
and it, when it comes back, it will be we'll, we're just going through the uh, we're just going through the um, uh, we're just going we're. we're we're just going through the ASCII character set, so it's not a, really a big deal. I'm just incrementing it by one. Oh, and look. Oh, yeah, there. So now we're back to the I. Kind of cool, huh? And But that's lowercase i, lowercase j. And if you did the math, you'd, you could see where all those disappeared to. Um, okay, well, anyway. So that's the display. You can, you can issue commands and whatnot. I'm not going to go through all that. I think I'll probably give you a little more. I'll probably doing a little more video uh, or maybe even post one that I've done before that shows uh, uh, how all that works. Okay, so let me just go through the code a little bit, how this works. So we we have a couple of, um, a couple of files. In fact, I'll bring myself back here. Okay. So, so we can go through the code a little bit here. I'll just slide it over here. And, uh, and when you go through the code, what you can see is that we have a, a, we have a number of functions. We, ha we have an, uh, an I2C LCD command, uh, an I2C LD LCD uh, write, an I2C LCD init, an I2C LD LCD position, and then a busy. And we can use these, these, these commands to put to control the screen, basically, and uh, they're all they're all included in a little include file here. This is uh, i2c.h and i2c underscore lcd.h. Now, most of the i2c commands in i2c.h are used by this include file, and we don't really use too many. I don't know if we use any of them directly. Um, so, so we sort of have this indirect file here that we use, uh, and then this file calls the other ones. And you can see what these are if we pull up the header files. The I2C, these are the actual I2C files. And um, this is I2C init, wait, start, restart, stop, write, address, read, um, and yeah, and we showed the write. So that's all the functionality we need to make the I2C I just work great. But we, for the I2C uh, driven LCD display, we have to do several things. For instance, uh, let me look at that. So if I pull up this file, then you can see, for instance, when we do the, uh, when we do the, uh, um, well, this is, this is the busy routine. Okay. This just checks to see if it's busy. This is the init. So look at what we have to do to initialize the, the, the display. We have to issue start the slave address. And in, in the, in your case, hex 20 in my case uh, sorry in your case hex 27 in my case hex 20 and then we do a write 3c write 38 write 3c write 38 write 3c write 38 and that's because you're supposed to issue this 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 special write three times but you have to remember we're we're controlling this display using uh the i2c and the i2c uh device we're using is a special chip and it has it has eight pins that it can use. So even though the actual interface to the ISO to the to our uh, display is actually um, actually has these these fourteen pins right here. Eight of these pins are data pins, and then we have the uh, R the VO pin, which is used by the pot, and then we have three control lines. The register select whether we're going to do commands or data. The read write whether we're going to write a zero or read a one, and the enable which is like the clock. So we don't we don't use data zero, data one, data two, and data three, because we don't have enough lines in our in our interface I two C interface chip to make that happen. We've only got eight lines, and so we use we use uh, the three control lines R S R W and E. And we use the upper four data lines for four bit mode, D4, D5, D6, D7. So that's th seven lines. And our eighth line controls a little BJT transistor, which can turn on and off the backlight. Um, and we just leave it on all the time. So whenever we write, 
we actually have to write all eight bits. Now the VO line here, that's set by the potentiometer. We don't control that line. But we control, and then these four, these four lowercase, uh, the four uh, lower nibble data lines, we just, uh, we just, uh, we just, um, I, I think we pull them down to ground or something. I forget. They're, they're, they're terminated, but they're not, they're not doing anything. All right. They're not connected to our to our chip, and the chip that we use is this chip called a PCF8574, and it's a it's a really cool I2C chip. They're fairly inexpensive, and what they do is they give you uh, they let you write an I2C byte to this chip, and the eight output lines from this chip will put out whatever those eight bits you wrote, and you can also use it to read, but the reading's a little tricky. Uh, because it, it doesn't really buffer the input, the read, so that's a, that's a little bit tricky. But you can definitely do it, and I'm, I'm doing it with this, with, these, uh, with this code. So again, we use 7 for the 4-bit mode, 3 control lines and 4 data lines, and then we use this, the 8th bit to turn on our backlight. All right, well anyway, um, there's a really great article by Julian Eilert, uh, that describes the function, and I've, I've, these are in the notes. They're also on Blackboard. Uh, so if you go to Blackboard and we pull up the course, and we go down, you'll see down here we have uh, somewhere I think the LCD file. Yeah, so we have LCD files and LCD instructions. So the instructions are right here, and these are the these are the two Julian Eilert articles, and I. You, if you, uh, it, it would really be smart for you to read these. These are really very, uh, they're not very, maybe 10 pages or something each, part one and part two. Um, and if you read both parts, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know all there is to know about uh, the two line by 16 or well, any of the, any of the uh, LCD interfaces because they all work the same. All right, so I think I'm going to, so I think I'm going to, I may, let's see, we get to kill this. Yeah. So here's what the commands look like. I'm not going to go through all these. I will demonstrate them. Um, uh, I'll do a video where I demonstrate these uh, and show you exactly how this works. And it talks about the timing considerations. Now notice most of the commands to the chip take 40 milliseconds. Uh, sorry, 40 microseconds. But notice two of the commands take 1.64 milliseconds. That is a huge difference from 40 microseconds. That's like, you know, it's it's what it's, I don't know, it's times 10 would be 400 uh, microseconds, and times 100 would be 4 milliseconds. So it's 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 not quite two full orders of magnitude, but almost. So anyway, and these are the commands, and this is very. Uh, we have commands to uh, clear the screen, uh, put the put the uh, the address to the zero position, uh, put the cursor there. You can set make the cursor a blinking cursor. You can turn the cursor on and off. You can turn the display on and off. You can uh, have the display scroll different ways whenever you write a new character. Uh, uh, by default, it will shift one place to the right every time you write a character, and then you can. Um, you can also, it has a uh, character generator uh, read, random access memory, which you can load up with your own information, and then you can display your own characters. And I, we've actually had students do this in the course. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, and, then, um, and, and then you can, uh, you can actually read. There is a busy bit, and it is, it is the data bit 7, and you can read that data bit uh, from the device, uh, and that tells you if you want to just put in a fixed delay of at least 1.64 milliseconds, that will cover everything. But that really does slow the display down quite a bit when you could normally do just 40 microseconds. Um, so you can see, now remember, we can execute an instruction every microsecond. So when we wait 40 microseconds, we could have executed 40 instructions. And when we wait 1.64 milliseconds, we could have executed 1,640 instructions in that time. 
not counting branches, right, which take two microseconds. And if we ran our clock even faster at 32 megahertz, then we could we can do um, we can do eight instructions every microsecond. So that would be eight times that. So you really do slow yourself down if you don't check the busy bit. Um, but you can put a fixed delay in if you want, or you could even use interrupts and other things. But all right, and we'll talk about this. And then and then when you want to write, uh, so the the 16. I already said this. Uh, the two lines are 0, 0, 0, F, and the bottom line is 40 to 4 F. And let's see. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. Yeah, the, here's the one with the little daughter with the little I2C daughter board, and it just fits right in here. A solder's on, and uh, and it works great. So you can run these in parallel mode, or you can use this I2C interface board, which is really nice. And there is the uh, the PCF chip that that has that lets you talk to the chip with uh, I squared C, and then when you write it eight bits, it puts out eight bits. And again, uh, it has of course more pins than eight bits, so it only drives the upper four data bits and the three control lines and with one bit left over to turn on and off a little transistor switch for the backlight. This little uh, jumper here has to be on if the backlight's going to work and that's just for the backlight. And that's the pot right there that you can adjust to get that so you can actually if that pot is misadjusted you won't see anything on the display at all. So don't panic. Your display is not broken. Just adjust the little pot. Okay. Do be careful not to hook it up backwards. If you put ground to VCC and VCC, and VCC to ground, you will burn it out. Please don't do that. Hook it up carefully. You can mix the SDA and the SCL. That's not a problem. But don't mix ground and power. That has to be correct. Okay. I think that's all I'm going to go over now. And um, we've covered most of the things I wanted to cover. So... Um, So uh, we'll, we'll basically quit with that. Uh, so I promise I will come back and I'm going to demonstrate it a little more. I'm going to actually go through the commands. I'm going to show you what it looks like when you turn it on, uh, when you set the cursor to underline blinking, and then when you switch your registers from command mode to data mode and you start writing uh, ASCII characters, what that looks like. All right. We will talk to you later then.